In this recording, we're going to look at question six in your pack, folks, particularly now on consolidated statement of cash flows. And again, before this, you should have looked at question one and two, looking at individual statement of cash flows. And then question three, four, and five, looking at smaller little scenarios about how the acquisition or disposal of a subsidiary will impact on a statement of cash flows. So we're given a situation here, splash, which are given the consolidated PL for 2011, last year in 2012. Uh, this year it's a consolidated statement of financial position, should I say? So we're to try and reconcile between these balances. They have this separate subsidiary then MUC, which was acquired during the year, as you're told down here, uh, acquired during the year for particular consideration. And then you're given the consolidated PL for the year as well. So what we try and look at, and we'll have looked at in the lecture, and you'll have looked at in question three, four, and five is the acquisition or disposal of subsidiary during the year will have an impact on all the line items. So they will help explain some of the movement in property plants and equipment, they'll help explain some of the movement in working capital, some of the movement in cash flows, some of the movement in, for example, shares, if there was a share issue as part of the consideration. So there's a lot of moving parts that we need to consider. But again, your starting point here to prepare consolidated statement of cash flows is you set up the template. So you have a template like that. I usually leave one line for operating cash flows because I do that as working one. You have a couple of lines for investing and a couple of lines for financing and you slot them in then as you go. So there's quite a structure to it. And our first working is always going to be our answer. So we're going to try and figure out here what is the movement in cash and cash equivalents. And we're looking at 2012 and we're looking at 2011. Just tidy up all that so we get a little bit the same one. So a working one, then we're going to look at bank and cash. What is the actual answer we're working towards? Cash and cash equivalents here, uh, you're moving from 85 down to 40. So we call that C and CE, 85 down to 40. You just check if there's any bank overdraft because that's, of course, a cash equivalent as well. There isn't in this case, it's all merged in. So you're saying here the net movement in cash and cash equivalents is minus 45. Right. So just make sure that that's nice and neat. So when we're doing all the other calculations. So you're seeing here you have a reduction of 45. So your cash and cash equivalents start of the year were 85, end of the year were 40. So that means your answer here is minus 45. So what we'll say there is that's actually the decrease in cash and cash equivalents. So that's what we're working towards. So when we do our operating cash flows, our financing cash flows, and our investing cash flows, they should all sum back to uh, come to negative 45. Right. So that's your, always your starting point is figure out your answer. Working two now, we're gonna do the indirect method. So you can do the direct method if you want, there's no need to do both. And we're gonna start with a profit figure, do our non-cash adjustments, uh, and then also do our working capital adjustments as well. So first thing is we take the profit figure based on what's given in the question. You're taking profit before tax or profit from operations. I always go with operating profit because it saves you having to add back all of these because these are not necessarily cash flows. They are just uh, accounting adjustments, interest expense, which is the expense incurred and share of profit from associate is not the same as money received from the associate. So we're going to start off with operating profit and that is going to be 1210 and what you're going to do then is you're going to say non-cash adjustments and it's the same every time whether it is a single cash flow for a single company or for a group cash flow so if you go down through the question think what are the normal adjustments we'd expect to see then for at non-cash adjustments so we're told here splash issued shares at a premium of 25 cent and paid cash consideration to acquire three quarters of muck. So that means you have a 25% NCI. And there was a fair value adjustment in 90,000 and goodwill and acquisition was 120. So when we're, for example, up here, explaining the movement in share capital, we're explaining the movement in intangible assets or explaining the movement in PPE, we need to account for what happened during the year uh, when this subsidiary is acquired. So that's important when you're dealing with a console cash flow, uh, the acquisition or disposal of a sub does slightly complicate things.
So we're told then during the year, property planted equipment with a carrying value of 800 was sold for 680 and depreciation was 782. Well, the first easiest thing is put in your depreciation. That was 782. That's a non-cash adjustment. And then we have to figure out, did we make a profit or loss on disposal? Carrying value was 800, sold for 680. That's clearly a loss on disposal. So you have a loss on disposal there of 680 compared to 800. You have a loss on disposal of 120, and you need to add that back as well. So that's coming from what you sold it for compared to what it was carried at. Now, a good student, if they were being alert, they'd slot in the 680 now as well, because that's your proceeds. Some questions get you to calculate what the proceeds are, others give them to you. So in our case here, you would have investing activities, sale of PPE, and that will just be 680. So that's what you'll write down. It's given directly in the question. You have no more work to do. So it's a nice one to slot in if you get a chance. You can leave it at the end as well. But there's your 680. That's where it's coming from. So you saw net book value was 800, but the disposal proceeds were only 680. So we have no other notes, but there is one other thing you always have to check for. And this is the thing that you have to note when you're looking at consolidated cash flows is, is there an impairment of goodwill? Because remember, an impairment of goodwill is a non-cash adjustment. And how we need to figure that out is, we need to look at intangibles. So this is a tricky one now, we're gonna to go to working three. Goodwill. So we need to check for impairment. So if you look at the intangibles, we're looking at the intangibles line here. The intangibles opening balance, 2011, was 310. Closing balance in 2012, it's gone up to 350. So we're trying to explain how do we go from 310 to 350, right? Now, there's one important thing that you have to realize is the goodwill and acquisition, right? So if you wanted to do a goodwill, for example here, a goodwill T account or an intangible T account just to show it, that would read as balance brought down, down here, you'd have balance carried down. That'd be 350 and that'd be 310. Now remember, intangibles is a catch-all. That would include your goodwill. And what we're trying to show you here is some exam questions like this one give you what goodwill was. You don't have to do the goodwill adjustment out. The goodwill and acquisition was 120,000. So that meant here, the acquisition of the sub, you would have increased intangibles by 120, meaning if nothing else happened, your closing intangibles should have been 430 because your opening balance plus your acquisition for the year should have got your closing balance. It is actually only 350. So there's an 80 plug figure on the credit side. Now remember that wasn't, you weren't told to do that. You just have to know how uh, an acquisition of a subsidiary impacts on different line items. And that would have went to the SOPL. That would have been goodwill impairment. It would have been credit goodwill, debit the SOPL. So what you have to do then is you have to come back and say that's impairment of goodwill. Now we're assuming it's impairment. If it was amortization of intangibles, it'd be the same thing. You're still adding it back. It's non-cash of 80. And a good student there will reference their working three to show you where that calculation comes from. Now, as I said, if this was an exam level question, you probably wouldn't be told goodwill because you'll be told the investment. So I'll just show you to prove it. The investment here that was meant, 400,001 euro shares at 25 cent premium, which is 400 times 1.25, which is 500, plus 197.5 of cash. So the investment for 75% was 697.5. The NCI, we have to measure yet. We're assuming it's measured in method one, You're not told otherwise. And then the fair value of net assets at acquisition was ordinary share capital, retained earnings, and your fair value adjustment. So you're, do, you're still doing the similar things you would have done for a normal IFRS 3 adjustment. The fair value adjustment is 90. 
retained earnings. And we told it here, we are up here, you're told at the date of acquisition. So you're given the balance sheet at that date. You don't want the balance sheet at the year end. You want it at the date of acquisition to note the cash flow impact was 500, 180. 500, that's easy. And we put in share premium, 100. So fair value net assets was 770 and the NCI will get 25% of that. Because remember the NCI is measured using method one. So that will be 890. And that means your goodwill is 890 minus 770, which is your 120. So I said, give, by giving you the 120, it simplified the question. But if that was an exam level question, you'll be doing your normal goodwill as you would always. But what you have to remember now is all of these line item adjustments will influence your statement of cash flow workings. So this will help explain the movement in NCI. This will help explain the movement in cash and explain the movement in share capital. Some of what is the issue of shares. And for example, the fair value adjustment will help explain the movement in group property, plant and equipment. So there are a lot of moving parts that does take a bit of getting used to when you're moving towards a consolidated statement of cash flows. So there are the, all the non-cash adjustments you have. So you're doing loss and disposal, you add back, add back depreciation, add back uh, impairment of goodwill. So your subtotal here, your running subtotal in is 2192. What we then have is our normal working capital adjustments. Now this is where you have to be careful. You still have inventory, you still have trade receivables, trade payables, but we're gonna go down and do a separate working, working for. Because what you have to do now is you have to account for the movement um, in the subsidiary as well. So working for, we're looking at inventory, trade receivables, trade payables. And we're looking at opening balance, closing balance, and that's the movement. Now you'll see why I'm going at it like this, because there is a bit more complexity when we have a subsidiary acquisition or disposal during the year. So we're looking at the group's financial statements. Opening inventory, 610, closing 740. Trade receivables, 350 and 390. And trade payables, 480 and 520. So what we're looking at here then, bring these together. So we're saying this is an increase, and right underneath, an increase of 130. This is an increase of 40, and that is an increase of 40. Now, what we would usually do then is take these particular items, these movements, and figure out whether that's a positive or negative impact on cash flow. But you need to consider the sub acquisition. Why that's important is, actually, the underlying group didn't have an increase of inventory of 130 during the year, because in these closing balances, this includes muck, whereas this excludes muck. So you need to strip out the impact of the subsidiary acquisition to get the true underlying movement in working capital. And that's quite tricky because you're not comparing like for like there. So that 130 increase, 150 of that actually related to the subsidiary. So the net is a 20 decrease. So the net is a 20 decrease for the group because a 20 decrease plus another 150 coming from the sub gives you a net 130 increase. That's where you're coming from. You have to try and separate out. There's a number of ways of doing it, but you have to get to the same answer. Uh, trade receivables, you had a net increase of 40, but actually in that 390 includes 85 when you acquire the subsidiary. So stripping out that 85 actually means a 45 decrease. You only want to look at the net group position underlying. You want to strip out the impact of the subsidiary acquisition because that doesn't impact on cash flow like this, it impacts it elsewhere. And finally then trade payables, you took on 75 as part of the subsidiaries, that actually meant a 35 decrease. So that's one of the hardest parts of consolidated cash flows 
is stripping out the impact of the acquisition. So a decrease for inventory and trade receivables is positive for cash flow. So that's a positive 20, that's a positive 45, and a decrease in trade receipt, trade payables, should I say, that is bad for cash flow. So they're the opposite. That means you owe people less money, which means you must have paid them, which is a drain on cash flow. So watch for those, they're quite tricky. And that's what we covered in question three, four, and five uh, as this kind of introductory area to the key consolidation issue. So make sure you go back and look at those questions called RATCO. They're good examples of working capital adjustments. So we take those three and we get the subtotal of the impact. And that gets us a running total then of 2222. And you're left with interest and tax. We want to know interest paid and tax paid. That's always the last two line items that you will have to finish off your operating cash flows. So if you go back to the question then, you're looking in the consolidated PL. Consolid PL says you have interest expense of 100, income tax expense of 482. And we said in previous questions, they don't necessarily be the same as interest paid in cash terms and income tax paid in cash terms. So what you're always looking for is, is there any accrued interest or tax liabilities. So we'll take interest first because there isn't. If there's no mention of interest accruals, all you do is take the PL item, which is minus 100. And just reference there SOPL because there's no adjustment needed. Because if you've no opening or closing interest accrued, it must just simply be debit the PL 100, credit bank 100. And of course, we're interested in the credit bank from the perspective of the statement of cash flows. For tax, it's a bit more complicated because you do have an opening and closing liability and you have something taken in from the subsidiary during the year as well. So we're going to go there to working five and we're going to open up a T account. T account is often the easiest one to do it. Some students don't need it, but it's useful when you're starting off at least. So we'll copy down a T account structure. We'll say tax. Obviously, the other way around, so we'll just tidy up that. So, you're going to have an opening balance, which is balance, balance brought down, and you have a balance carry down. Your balance brought down here was 4210 and 455, and your SOPL charge for the year was the group 482. Now, usually what we would do is top them up then and say the balancing figure must be bank. What you have to remember as well is when you acquired the subsidiary, you're bringing in an extra tax because this subsidiary you're given, this was at the, at the acquisition date. So you would have debited these assets. You would have credited these liabilities. So actually one ten of that increase is explained by the subsidiary, not by cash flows. So you put in another 110 there to recognize the increase. So it should have been 802 at the year end. It's only 455. So you must have paid 347 to the tax man. Credit bank debit tax liability. And it's in yellow to signify that is a plug figure. Now that's tricky because you have to remember if I acquire a subsidiary and take on their liabilities, that has to be used to explain the movement in tax. So that is going to be tax minus 347, and that is working five. So that gets your net cash flow from operating activities of 1775. And it's the same approach every time. You can use the indirect method or the direct method if you wish, but you have to be able to do those adjustments, particularly the items of like goodwill. That was a tricky one. The working capital adjustments were tricky ones and getting the tax paid accounting for the subsidiary impact. All of those are quite tricky and it's important you do pay attention to. So you put in your 1775 then, is the cash flow from operating activities and the reference they are working to. So the examiner can see where it's coming from. And similar to all the other cash flow questions we've done, once you have that set up and ready to go, I go back to my question and I highlight the things I've already explained. I've explained intangible assets. I've explained inventories, receivables, cash equivalents. I've explained 
trade payables and I've explained taxation. So you have a good lot of them done, nearly half of them done. And what I do then is I go through the rest of the outline items and explain each one. And often my advice is open up a T account and consider what are the moving parts in the year. You're essentially solving a puzzle. How did I get from the opening balance, last year's closing balance, to this year's closing balance? Using the PL, using the subsidiary, and using the notes of the accounts. So it is like solving a puzzle. And the nice thing is we know what the puzzle's answer is. It's a decrease of 45. So let's start off then working six with properly plant and equipment. So we'll take another T account just to make it clear and think of all the moving parts. So if you want to now, you should pause this and see, can you make a stab at it yourself? Can I get all these moving parts and come to a right answer? All right. So let's have a look at the opening balance then. The opening balance and properly plant equipment for the group 2610 and the closing balance here 4730. Now remember here, this is property plant and equipment net book value. So it is the cost account and the accumulated depreciation merged together. In some questions, they'll show them separately and you'll have to do slightly different workings. Here they have them merged together. So what moves this during the year? Well, the first thing that will move it is depreciation, 782. That's given in the question. They said they charge depreciation 782. Well, that would have reduced your net book value during the year. Debit the PL, and we've adjusted for the PL already there to take it out. Credit the net book value of PP. Likewise, the disposal, you would have got rid of the 800. That would have helped explain the movement in PP because you disposed of something and you brought 680 in instead. And we've already put that in. The fair value adjustment, 90, and the acquisition of the sub because you acquired, if you look it up here, 610. That would have explained some of the movement as well. Because remember, when you do these, you're debiting the sub, you're debiting the groups, property, plant and equipment, when you have an acquisition of a sub. So all of these help explain the movements in PP. So it's not just as simple as looking for um, depreciation disposal. Don't forget the subsidiary as well. So the credit is the bigger side. It's 6312. So your debit should be 6312 as well. So the only thing that can balance it is you must have acquired assets during the year and the balancing figure there will be 3 million and 2,000. That would have been debit PP credit bank. So that's the acquisition of property plant and equipment and it's an outflow. But you can see if you ignore the subsidiary, for example, we left it out, you'd have 700 million bigger in terms of cash flow when you didn't pay for those in cash at all, you bought them as part of the subsidiary, which we will show separately in a second. So it is important you account for the move into the subsidiary as well. So working six there, acquisition of PP minus 3002, and we'll just say working six, show the examiner where it's coming from. Okay. Now, the other thing we have to put in here is acquisition of the sub. When you acquire a sub, you're going to pay money. And we know we've paid minus 197.5. So that's important. But what often students forget is you're getting a small bit of cash as well, because when you acquired the sub, it had 20 of cash. So actually, the net cash cost here is 177.5. So that was something you nearly should be slotting in from the start. It is 197.5 net of 20 cash on sub SOFP. So you always show the net cash cost. What you don't put in there, as we have down in the, the adjustment, you don't put in the share capital. That issue of share capital will help explain the movement in ordinary share capital and share premium in a second. It won't help explain cash because the issue of shares has nothing to do with cash. So just be careful of that. When you acquire a subsidiary, it'll be a cash inflow. When you dispose of a subsidiary, it'll be a cash outflow. And it's always the net cash position. How much you got uh, or how much you paid net of the amount of cash on the sub's balance sheet. Right, so they're okay. So 
We've dealt with PP. Next one is to deal with is associates. So we know this is the equity method under uh, IS28. And we just do a T account as well, going from 500 up to 520. So you try and think what are them things that will move an associate during the year. So your associate. Opening balance, 500. I'll delete the rest of these for now to make it easier. Closing balance, 520. There's only two things that are going to move an investment associate during the year. That's your SOPL profit, you, your share of profits, which is 240 from the associate. So if you didn't pay any dividends or didn't get any dividends from the associate, it should have been 740, but it's actually only 520. So your dividends, which go through bank, must have been the difference, which are 220. So that is important to watch out for. When you receive dividends from associate under the equity method, it is debit bank 220, credit investment associate 220. That's under IAS 28. So here, this is the plug figure you're looking for. Because if you had an opening balance, we assume there was no acquisition of another associate during the year. So it should have been 740 at the end of the year, opening plus profits. It's only 520, so you must have got dividends there of 220. And they are uh, an investment cash flow associate dividend. And that's a plus 220. And that's coming from working seven. Just showing the examiners you go down long where these are coming from. Right. That's another thing we can highlight off. So there is a nice structure on it, as long as you know what you're looking for and you understand the basic console. Now, ordinary share capital and share premium. We're not worried about the subsidiary. What we're interested in is you always take these together. Your share capital and share premium have gone from 1.2 million to 1.7. Now, what a lot of students will say there, oh, that's an issue of share capital for 500,000 because you're going from 1.2, 1.7. All of that is explained by the acquisition of the subsidiary. So remember, if you go back in your goodwill calc, you said there's two pieces here. There's 500 of shares, which was 400 times 1.25, and there's 197.5 of cash. We've dealt with the cash by getting the net cash consideration. This will be helping explain how the parent's share capital has increased. So actually there, there's nothing else in there. There's no extra share issue. So there's no impact of a share issue. All of that is explained by you issuing shares in return for acquiring a subsidiary. So for that purpose, there's nothing to be done there other than to prove there's no impact. For retained earnings then, we're going to have to do a T account out. So this is going to be our working eight. So let's be working seven. So we look at working eight. So retained earnings. So what you're looking for here then is you're trying to figure out well how, what can reconcile retained earnings. The only thing can reconcile them is your dividends. What dividends were paid during the year? Opening retained earnings eight six five. Closing retained earnings, 1615. So I said, for some of you, you won't need to do T accounts out like that, and it's fine. Others, it can be helpful. Profit for the year. Be careful now in a consolidated PL, you only take the parent's profit. So if they said total comprehensive income as well, you wouldn't take that. You'd only take the profit, 764. So if no dividends were paid, you should have had 1629. You only have 1615. So the plug figure on the debit side is 14. And that is dividends paid to the parent. Debit retained earnings, credit bank. So I put that in yellow to signify that is a plug figure. So that's a financing cash outflow. But again, they don't tell you to do that. You have to make sure you know what you're looking for. Dividends to parent, minus 14, working nine working nine double check working eight that's another one done and you can take it off we're now looking then at nci so think about what moves the nci during the year 
opening balance 610, closing balance 580. So you can do a T account or you don't have to. So we'll just do a T account for completeness. Start a good lot of adjustments there. So in CI, your opening balance was 610. Your profit for the NCI for the year, just make sure you're taking the right one, was 104. So you're always assuming those PLs, etc., are correct. We'll never ask you to do a PL balance sheet and a cash flow. You'll either be asked to do PL balance sheet on its own or a cash flow on its own. We don't usually merge them because it's quite complicated doing everything together. So that means the PL, but the one thing a lot of students would have forgotten is the acquisition during the year. When you acquire a subsidiary during the year, you're going to increase coming from our working three. The NCI was 193, or technically it was 192.5. So see the way they're all linked together? That's 192.5. And that means if we didn't pay the NCI any dividend, we should have had, just bring it out, 906.5. And if we look at the balance sheet in the question, it says the closing one is 580. So 580 is the closing balance. That means a big dividend was paid to the NCI of 327. So 327 or 326.5 if you want to be precise. So there's a tricky element there, linking your goodwill working, valuing the NCI and bringing it back. So 326.5 is dividends paid to the NCI. That's a financing cash flow, NCI dividends. So remember, even though it's a consolidated cash flow, all your stuff that you'll have done in semester two uh, from week one to week six, all of those what we call vanilla type cash, consolidations, they're quite important here. You need to know your basics of consol before you go on to consol cash flow. So that's another one ticked off. Now I'm currently under it. And you probably won't even need a working for the last one, long-term loan. Your loan has gone from 1.1 to 1.9. That is an increase in a loan. That would have been debit bank, getting in the loan proceeds and credit loan, increase your liability. So that's a loan drawdown. And all I put there is a cash inflow. Loan drawdown plus 800. And I'll just put there SOFP to say I'm pulling that directly from the question. There's no, no real need uh, for a working. So there's a good bit of work there, particularly in terms of identifying the cost of subsidiary, identifying the NCI dividends by remembering you acquired an NCI during the year. Uh, but the beauty of it is when you do it up, as you go down along, you get the subtotal for investing, the subtotal for financing, and you add the three of them up. Much the same as you have in a balance sheet. If it balances, you give a good indication you're on the right track. If ours is getting close to the 45, we have a good indication. And even if it's not at the 45, you at least have an identify, you identify what the difference is. And something might jump out at you quite quickly and to figure out what you might have left out. And thankfully there, we have the minus 45, so we know we've got the answer correct. All right, so it's just important that you understand exactly um, how to approach a statement of cash flows. Set out your template, do the cash flow from operating activities first, then go down line by line in the question and tick them off as you cover them. And if you explain each one of those movements correctly, the things should balance. That there's a nice little element of a puzzle in that. So that was question six splash. There's plenty of other exam level questions now, seven, eight, and nine, that you should go on and practice. But in the first instance, make sure you have the basics around how you deal with a mid-year acquisition and a mid-year disposal for consolidated cash flows. It's quite tricky and there's a lot of new things that you wouldn't really come across when you're doing a consolidated PL and a consolidated statement of financial position.